Afraid you were going to be late. Well, how you betting on this legal battle? Think they'll put the old lady away? I'll quote the odds as soon as I look over the layout and ditch that heater. Hi, Mr. Denham. Oh, good morning, Mr. White. Hey, boss, how about we grab a couple of shots before things get started? Sure, huh? go ahead. Who is he? That's that famous columnist. I invited him here. I still think you shouldn't attend this hearing. Suppose they make a mistake and try you. You know, there are two schools of thought about the sanity of columnists. Quiet. All right, Miss Denham, would you mind giving me a great big... Not at all. ...smile? Thank you. Now remember, just leave everything to me. And don't let personal feelings enter into your testimony. We all know that Aunt Cassie is simply no longer capable of managing her money. We'll manage it much better for her. And besides, Aunt Cassie will be properly cared for in an institution. Don't you worry about a thing, Aunt Cassie. Why should I worry? I'm the only sane person in a family of nitwits. <coughs> she don't look crazy to me. Reminds me of my old lady. All kindness. I guarantee you she wouldn't hurt a fly. But you ought to see those wolves. You can see dollar signs all over their faces. They're just hoping to put the old lady in the funny house so they can spend all that dough she's got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it, brother. You got it. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable the Supreme Court in and for the County of New York is now in session. Judge Moore presiding. We will proceed with the sanity hearing of Miss Cassandra Denham. This action is brought by Attorney Garson Denham. And in behalf of himself and other relatives of said Cassandra Denham, who allege that the defendant is incompetent and physically and mentally unfit to administer her real and personal property, and pray therefore that she be committed to a suitable institution provided by the state for those adjudged mentally incompetent. Mentally incompetent. <laughs> You will proceed, Councillor Denham. Thank you, Your Honor. With your permission, I'll call the defendant in this action, Miss Cassandra Denham. Yeah. Place your right hand in the Bible. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Why not? The truth never hurt anybody. <laughs> But where is your attorney? Why should I spend money on an attorney when my only opposition is my nitwit nephew? <laughs> Touche. Hey, what does that mean? It means score one for the old lady. The court will be glad to appoint an attorney to represent you without charge if you desire one. No, thank you. I can take care of myself. <laughs> warn the spectators that this is no occasion for outbursts of hilarity. Uh, go ahead, Counselor. Thank you, Your Honor. What is your name? What is my... Your Honor, do I have to sit here and have my very own nephew ask me what my name is? Yes. Miss Cassandra Hildegard Denham. And what you need is a good spanking like I used to give you when you were a snip of a boy. <laughs> <laughs> The old lady's crazy like a fox. 
you will confine your answers to the questions. And the court will tolerate no further demonstrations. Go ahead, Counselor. Thank you. How much wealth do you possess, Miss Denham? Do I have to answer that question? Yes, yes. Three million dollars, and I'm going to hang on to it. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of those things, huh? Yeah, what? What, what you just said before, you know, a touche, touche. Yeah, you said a double. Yeah. I warn you, Miss Dunham, to confine your answers to the questions. I... The alien is cooperating with the court will disregard irrelevant flippancies on the part of the defendant. I trust this is understood. Where do you keep your money and securities, Miss Denham? Wouldn't you like to know? Uh... <laughs> now, this is my last warning. One more outburst on the part of the spectators in the courtroom will be cleared. Now, you will answer the question. I refuse to answer on the ground that my money is my own until you decide it isn't. And in the meantime, it's none of his business. <laughs> There's the smartest crazy woman I ever saw. Well, your objection is well put. Uh, you needn't answer. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Mr. Numb, would you say that you were eccentric? I live my own life, if that's what you mean. Did you or did you not recently give $500 to a man you'd never met? A total stranger. Not exactly a stranger. He was a farmer who lived up the road a piece from me. He was about to lose his farm and I gave him the money so he wouldn't lose it. Did you demand any security for this gift? Why should I? The man's honest. I thought he'd sleep better without a mortgage hanging over his head like uh, Damocles' sword. <laughs> but you did give this man $500 with no security whatsoever. Yes. Yes. Well, there you are, Your Honor. You see? It's perfectly obvious that my aunt is dissipating her assets. They're my assets. <laughs> I'll give you ten to one she never sees a padded cell. What do you think I am, a sucker? Yes. Proceed. Miss Denham, tell me, is it true that you use vinegar on your apple pie? Why, yes. Explain to the judge and the alienists, if you will, please, just why you douse vinegar on your apple pie. Gladly. <laughs> that fat cook of mine makes them too sweet. She's done it for years. She wants to put weight on me. <laughs> I give up, Your Honor. You should have done that long ago. <laughs> this action is dismissed for lack of evidence. <laughs> Hearing adjourned. Your Honor. Yes? I want to thank you. And if you ever come my way up in the mountains, drop in and have some apple pie. Without vinegar. Well, thanks. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. But I like vinegar on apple pie. <laughs> if you'd stop throwing those things around and tell me what you're looking for, maybe I could help you find it. Well, Brian, one of these days I'm going to clear off this desk. You do, and you'll be out of business. What are you looking for? I'm trying to find that Hollywood item that Danny Dover sent about a week ago. For your information, it's down the composing room, all set up in type. O'Brien, I don't know what I'd do without you. Neither do I. Now that you have that problem off your mind, do you think you'd like to see a caller? Who? Garson Denham. That lawyer who got his ears pinned back last week trying to put his aunt in an asylum. What does he want? Maybe he wants to put you in one. He seems sort of anxious about something. All right, I have him come in, but you stay in the room when I'm talking to him. I'm allergic to lawyers. Okay. Come in, Mr. Denham. Good morning, Mr. Denham. Good morning, Mr. White. May I, uh, may I speak to you alone, please? <laughs> I am alone. 
Miss O'Brien is part of me. Which part? Quiet. Have a chair, Mr. Denham. Speak freely. Thank you. You, uh, you look a bit worried. I am worried, Mr. White. This, this letter, this letter is definite proof that my Aunt Cassandra is mentally unbalanced. Mm-hmm. I don't get it. This is just a simple invitation for you to spend a week at her place in the mountains. Yes, but she sent the same invitation to all the Denhams. And, and you'll notice she insists that we all arrive Friday. Friday, promptly, at midnight. Now, now why should she want us all to arrive at Greylock promptly on the stroke of 12? Perhaps 12 is her favorite number. I tell you, there's something sinister about this invitation. You'll notice she also says that any relative who fails to show up will be eliminated from her will. Yeah, I noticed that. A sort of a command performance, isn't it? Oh, it ought to be a cozy little group. With all you denims gathered around the festive board with the old lady you try to put in the booby hatch. I tell you, I have, I have a feeling that something terrible is going to happen. Oh, come, Mr. Denham, you're taking it all too seriously. She probably just wants to bury the hatchet now that she's been declared sane. Sure, it's a great sport. Burying hatchets at midnight, especially in people. You may scoff, but I have a premonition of death. I believe she plans to kill us all. After which, she'll probably confess and say, Sheriff, I did it with my little hatchet. Oh, stop it. Stop it, O'Brien. Hey, it does seem funny. Oh, poppycock. I watch your aunt on the witness stand, and she's no killer. She's intelligent and harmless. And what a sense of humor. It may strike her as humorous to murder us all in our beds. Mr. White, I'm going to leave this letter with you, just in case anything does happen to me. This fantastic idea of having us arrive at midnight. It's the hand of work of a madwoman. You'll see that... Okay, Mr. Denham, I'll be watching for murder news from Greylock. And if anything does happen, you'll see that she's brought to justice? Oh, sure. Thank you, Mr. White. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Denham. See you in a shroud. Well? You know, this has all the elements of a swell murder mystery. Greedy relatives try to toss wealthy aunt into the booby hatch so they get a hold of her money. Wealthy aunt outsmarts them and is declared sane. Then she invites them all to her place in the mountains to spend a week and tells them to get there exactly at midnight. Midnight. That midnight angle intrigues me. Forget it. How about your stuff for tomorrow night's broadcast? Midnight. Now, why should she insist on midnight? She probably saw the cat on the canary. Now... Will you please go back to work? Okay, O'Brien, you slave driver. Here's the leave for the broadcast. See, I'd like to sit in on this little gathering. You know, it ought to be funny. I wonder if I drove up there in my car to Greylock. Oh, well. I can't say we aren't prompt. It's still only 10 minutes to 12. I don't care what time it is. We shouldn't be visiting a crazy woman. No, stop it. Will you stop it? Oh, good evening, Eric. Evening. Any of the others arrived yet? Not yet. Well, I guess we might as well go along in, then. Guess you had. Twas you'd be too late. Too late for what? Too late to be murdered, no doubt. I tell you, Larry, I don't like this. After all, Aunt Cassie is your father's sister. And as your father's widow, I think I ought to tell you that... That father was a bit balmy. Yes, Mother, I've heard all that before. Well, you mark my words. Oh, please, Mother, do we have to go through that again? You better go on in if you want to be with Miss Cassie when the clock strikes midnight. Oh, 
here, aren't they? I watched them come from my garden. Yeah, they're all here. Fine. Fine. For goodness sakes, Garson, stop that pacing. You're making me nervous. Nervous? How do you think I feel? Ah, uh, you should feel nervous. You started this whole thing, getting us to sign that complaint against Aunt Cassie. That's right. Blame me for everything. Of course, you'd have been highly pleased if I'd succeeded. Naturally. But you didn't. And now we have to spend the week in this ratty old mansion. It isn't compulsory, you know. You can leave any time. Sure we can. And have Aunt Cassie cut us out of her will. You'd love that, wouldn't you? No, thanks. We are staying. Well, I'm hungry. I think I'll see if there's anything good in the icebox. Tom Denham, don't you dare leave this room. How can you even think of food when we're all in danger? What danger? Why, Aunt Cassie wouldn't hurt a fly. Welcome to my precious relatives. Aunt Cassie and Cousin Mary. Aunt Cassie, I know that I speak for all of us when I say that we're delighted to be here. We certainly are. And I always look forward to visiting your charming old mansion. Greylock is such a lovely, restful place. Oh, Aunt Cassie, you look younger every day. Poppycock, stop fawning over me. A week ago, you were trying to put me in a padded cell. <laughs> but Aunt Cassie, you know we only did it for your own protection. And to get her money. Keep quiet, child. I'll handle this. I've been protecting myself for 40 years, since I was 25. I've done a pretty good job of it. So let's forget about protection and uh, sit down, everybody. First, I want you to know I brought you here for a purpose. I want to study you all for a week. Just like a scientist studies rats and guinea pigs in his laboratory. After all, I'm 65. I can't live forever. Everyone must die someday. Oh, please, Aunt Cassie, don't talk about dying. Why, you're the picture of health. And, well, I want to say right now that I had nothing to do with the attempt to, well, send you away. It was all Cousin Garson's fault. He talked everybody into signing the petition. Silence. I don't care who started it. The fact remains that sooner or later I leave this veil of tears and laughter. <laughs> and when I do, I leave three million dollars. The bulk of it will go to the one I find most worthy. Which means, of course, I leave it to someone in this room. The worthiest of an unworthy lot. <laughs> but I warn you, flattery will get you nowhere. So be yourselves. We'll retire now. Breakfast will be served at eight. I'll expect you, all of you, to be at the table promptly. I hope you sleep well. Don't let the knowledge that you're sleeping under the same roof with three million dollars disturb your slumbers. <laughs> Come, child. And Cassie, you mean that you keep all that money here in this house? Why not? Was everyone trying to take it away from me? I like to keep it around to check up on it once in a while. But don't try to look for it. You wouldn't find it in a million years. Did you ring, Miss Cassie? Uh, yes. Have you uh, placed the luggage in the right rooms? Everything is just as you ordered it. Good. Now we'll all have a splendid night's sleep. Come along. I'll distribute you.
for goodness sake, quit threshing around like a hooked fish and go to sleep. Oh, I can't sleep. I've got too many things on my mind. Of course, you wouldn't understand that, not having any mind to speak of. Well, I like that. You dragged me away from home to spend a week in this dreary museum, and now you insult me. Where are you going? To get a book from the library. Have you any objections? No. Go ahead. Go and get killed wandering around in the middle of the night. You said yourself you had a premonition of death before we left home. Well, I've revised my estimate of the situation. Aunt Cassie may be a bit eccentric, but we're not in any danger. You go to sleep. I shan't be long. Digging in, pulling on covers. You got a telephone to answer. Wake up now. You certain is a sleeping this man? Oh, give me those covers. Your big you? trouble wants you on a telephone. Ain't no use arguing with Miss Nora. Oh, Brian. Oh. Boy, at 10 o'clock in the morning, she knows better than that. Tell her I never talked to anybody in my sleep. She said you'd jump right out of bed if I tell your lawyer Denham have met her with some killing. What? Yes, indeed. And Mr. Denham's a corpse. Well, why did you say so? I kept trying to, sir. Well, pack me a bag. Yes, Hurry up. Sir. Yes, sir. All right, you murdered me. You can't come in here. I uh, think you're wrong, officer. My press card. Uh, my membership card in your lodge. Uh, Sheriff's Association. Uh, here, you might as well look these over, too. Honorary memberships and police organizations from Miami to Los Angeles. Goofy, isn't it? But then some people collect matches. Are you really Bob White, the fellow that writes a column? In the flash, officer. Meet my secretary, Miss Nora O'Brien, and the alert young gentleman on the other side is Eddie Stutz, one of the best newspaper photographers in New York. I'm sure he'll want to take your picture before we leave, won't we, Eddie? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, where will I find the sheriff? Oh, Sheriff Boggs is holding an inquiry in the house right this minute. Thanks, officer. Be vigilant. 
Somebody in this room killed Garson Denham with that knife, and I propose to find out who did it. Why don't you get on with it instead of walking up and down, talking your head off? Murder cases take time. I've got to do a lot of deducting. Deducting? You sound like a millionaire making out his income tax. All right, everybody, hold it, please. Thank you. Who are you? I'm Bob White, New York Evening Register, with cameraman and secretary. Now, tell me who you are, let me think. You're, uh... You're Sheriff Boggs, and you're conducting an inquiry into the death of Garson Denham. Hi, Sheriff. How is the inquiry progressing? Well, confidential, Mr. White, it ain't going so hot. Oh. They won't talk. Nobody knows nothing. Open and shut case, huh? Mostly shut. Shutter in the Dickens, but I'll solve it. You may not know it, Mr. White, but I'm a regular reader of your column. Well, thanks, Sheriff. Make a note of that. I got another reader. Maybe when I do solve this dastardly crime, you can write one of them editorials about me, like you wrote about... J. Edgar Hoover, or Dr. Defoe. Well, I'd be glad to, Sheriff, but uh, how about the crime? Got any clues? Only this knife. I found it sticking in the uh, copper stalactite. Take a look at it. No, 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 Sheriff. You, you take care of that. I'm allergic to knives. Mm, it dates way back to the time he learned to use a fork. Quiet. Well, Miss Denham, I see your family reunion got off to a nice little murder. Oh, something's always interfering with my plans. If you mention me in your column, be sure and spell my name right. Oh, you, uh, read my column? Yes. Oh, thank you. I was scared to death they'd ask me that on the witness stand. If I'd admitted it, they'd have thought sure I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Miss Denham, you and I are just going to get along fine. Just, just fine. <laughs> Tell you I got orders not to let anybody in here. Tell me I can't come calling Cassie Denham when she's in trouble. Get out of my way. Why, what are they doing to you, Cassandra? Are they accusing you of killing Garson Denham? If they are, I can tell them they're wrong. Any man who went snooping around like he did last night was bound to get his comeuppance. How do you know he was snooping? I saw him through the library window. What time was that? About one o'clock in the morning. Trowbridge Montrose, what were you doing looking through my library window at one o'clock in the morning? Probably looking for a book. Speak up, Mr. Montrose. How do you happen to be snooping at that hour? I was walking in my garden. All of a sudden, I saw a light come on in Cassie's library. I peeked through the window and saw Garson Denham snooping, looking behind pictures and pulling books from shelves. What else did you see? Well, that was all. When he quit snooping and sat down to read, I went home. Do you generally walk in your garden at one o'clock in the morning? Always, when the flowers are in bloom. The scent of flowers at night is much sweeter than it is in the daytime. I love the scent of flowers at night. Your name wouldn't be Ferdinand, would it? No. I was christened Trowbridge Cadwallader Monroe. However, my grandfather's name was Ferdinand. That explains it. Probably hereditary. What is hereditary? Uh, look, Mr. Montrose, suppose we forget the whole thing. Mr. White, what is your theory of this crime? Well, Sheriff, I haven't had time to theorize, but I have a suggestion. What is I have a friend in New York by the name of Philo Christopher. Now, he writes murder mysteries. If I send for him properly, he could help. Oh, no, you don't. I've read all his books, and I don't like the way he solves his crimes. He always brings in an outside character in the last three pages and pins the murder on him, just to fool his readers. Nobody's going to pin this murder on an outside character. Somebody in this room killed Garson Denham, and I'm going to apprehend the guilty party. An admirable determination, Sheriff, and well put. In the meantime, we'll go to the village and arrange accommodations. You'll do nothing of the kind. We have plenty of empty rooms here, and you're welcome to stay. In fact, Mr. White, you can sleep in a bed George Washington once slept in. What, another? Father of our country certainly got around, didn't he? I accept your hospitality, Miss Cassandra, and you're very kind. In the meantime, Sheriff, what happens now? I don't rightly know. You fool, you blundering idiot. How can you be so dumb? You know this mad woman committed murder. Why don't you arrest her? Now, take it easy, Mrs. Denham. I've got no proof that she killed your husband. Proof? 
more proof do you want? She invited us here for a visit and insisted we arrive at midnight. Then she informed us she's going to study us for a week, like rats or guinea pigs. She had every reason to kill Gossam because he wanted to put her where she belonged in an asylum. I demand that you arrest her. Now, oh, hold on. Aunt Cassie's been doing queer things around these parts as long as I can remember. But she ain't crazy. The court just decided that. And I'm arresting nobody till I've got proof. You fool! You're protecting a murderess. Tom, take me home. I'll not stay in this house another minute. Oh, yes, you will. Nobody's leaving Greylock till I apprehend the killer. Tom, take me to my room. You all heard what I said. Nobody's leaving the grounds until this crime's cleared up. I'll have men guard the place day and night. That's all for now. But what about me? I live next door. You can go home. My men will keep an eye on you. Maybe after you get unpacked, you would kind of like to talk this case over before the coroner gets here. Thanks, Sheriff. I'll be glad to. Sutton, see that the press is made comfortable. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Come, Mary. I don't like this, Sherlock. I'm scared stiff. Chin up, Watson. old place, don't you think? Yes. Wonderful view from that window. Have a look. Yeah? I told you the view was wonderful. Yeah, but the murderer used a knife. Well, maybe the next victim will be poisoned. Listen, honey, don't let this thing get you. There won't be any more murders. Come on, let's go down and kip us with the sheriff. <laughs> Hi, Sheriff. Any fingerprints? Nope. Can't find any. Take a look. Oh, thanks. You see any? Come on, Sheriff. Give me a shot of you holding the knife. A little higher. Hold it. Thank you. Has the corpus delicti been removed yet? Nope, it's still in the library where the coroner left it. The undertaker's coming from the village. Do you mind if I take a look at it? No, come on. Thanks. You better stay here, this is not for you. I'm a newspaper man, I can take it. Hey, wait a minute. That ain't Garson Denham. You're right, Sheriff, that's Larry Denham. But he sure is a corpus delictus. Oh, look! Whoever knocked him off must have come in the window. You're a smart fella. No signs of anybody. I'm going to round up everybody and question them. They can't do this to me. Killing a man in broad daylight and I'm right in the next room. Well, here we go again, Miss Denham. <laughs> what happened? Have they found the murderer? Well, if he hasn't, my bath water's getting cold for nothing. Be quiet. Where were you during the last half hour? I was transplanting a tree near the entrance gate. Deputy Judkins was with me. That's right, Sheriff. What about you? 
I was greasing the car in the garage. You look it. What are you doing? I was making apple pies. And I'll never be done for dinner at this rate. You got an alibi? I was counting the laundry. The cook saw me. What were you doing? I was spraying roses in my garden. That's what he was doing, Sheriff. I saw him mix the spray. So did I. Poison. I always use poison in my rose spray. It's certain death to insects. Where are you, Miss Cassie? I was running my bath. Oh! What's the matter? I have the water running to ruin everything. Oh! Stay right here. One of you boys run upstairs and turn off Miss Cassie's bath water. Sit down. Anybody with you while you were drawing this bath? Yes, I was. Oh. For a moment, I thought I had something. And I was walking in the garden by the summer house. You didn't walk by the library by any chance, did you? Yes. Yes, I did. Why? Oh, just idle curiosity. Anybody see you taking this walk? I was watching him all the time, Sheriff. He never got out of my sight. Well, Sheriff, that's that. It sure is. How about you, Mrs. Denham? I was lying down, trying to rest. Where's Larry? Sheriff. Where's Larry? Why, uh... See him. Larry's not here. Hey, you're right, ma'am. He ain't. He's dead. Dead? You mean... You mean Larry's been murdered? Yes. Not only that, somebody stole the other car for Stelicta. I told you to arrest her. I warned you this thing would happen. Woman is mad. She'll kill us all. Larry! <laughs> My poor Larry! What do I do now? Well, did you call the coroner? No. I plumb forgot it. One of you boys call the coroner right away. That's all for now. What I said about nobody leaving the grounds still goes. Hello, Mary. All right, boys, keep an eye outside. What do you folks make of this? They've all got alibis. I'm beginning to think maybe I did it. If you did, you're holding out on your paper. You haven't phoned in your story yet. That's right, I haven't. Proving you're a columnist, not a reporter. Now look, mister. Let's get out of this funny house and go back to New York. They'll be dancing in 52nd Street tonight while we're playing tag with a knife thrower. You've got a fair start with your column with readers from New York to Shanghai, China. Why take a chance? Relax, beautiful. Nobody's gonna harm me. I'm the handsome young juvenile in this story. He never gets hurt. Now, you'll be a good girl. Get the editor on the phone and give him enough stuff for a flash bullet. Tell him I'll send him a follow-up story in an hour. Okay. Swap. Say, uh, Sheriff, do you suppose we can do a little snooping in the library there before the coroner gets here? Oh, I guess it'd be all right if we don't disturb nothing. Swell. It's gone. There ain't no corpus delicta. Things are now beginning to conform to pattern. What are you talking about? There comes a time in every murder mystery when all of the corpus delicti are missing. It generally happens just past the middle of the picture. I don't know how you feel, pal. This thing's got me stumped, too. But we'll both keep trying. We'll think it out together, eh, pal? Yes, sir. The law always catches up to the guilty party. at once or you will die.
Better come out of there or I'll shoot. Never mind my shirt, I just found the bodies. Where? Fell out of a closet in my room. Lead the way. Where are the bodies? I don't see anyone. Why, they're gone. Are you sure you're not ill? You got a bottle you've been holding out on me. Why, I tell you, they were right there. I came out of that bathroom and the statue was gone. There was a note there saying, you leave gray like I was or you die. I rushed to the door and it was locked. I looked at the key and I saw it was turned. So I knew there was somebody inside this room. So I went to the window there and it was locked. So I grabbed my pistol out of that drawer. Then what? And I pointed right at the door and I said, come out of there or I'll shoot. But they didn't come out. So I went over to the door like this. And I pulled it wide open. There they are again. Who's crazy now? Huh? Give me time, I'll find out who stole that statue and wrote that note, too. I don't care anything about statues or notes. Somebody call the coroner an undertaker. I've got the two corpus delictuses, and by golly, nobody's going to take them away from me. Sheriff, don't you think you ought to let my relatives go home? If the whole family is killed off, there'll be nobody to inherit my money. Sorry, Miss Cassie. Nobody leaves till I find the killer. Don't say I didn't warn you. I'll bet you a pretty penny there'll be more killings before this thing is over. Now, Mary. 10 o'clock and time for the last minute news and flashes. Fernbry, New York. Sheriff William Boggs in charge of the investigation of two murders which occurred during the past 24 hours at Greylock, the lovely mountain estate of Miss Cassandra Denham, issued a statement an hour ago predicting early apprehension of the killer. Several important clues have been unearthed, the sheriff declared. Detroit, Michigan. Pickets, picketed pickets today when... Oh, you've got some new clues, eh, Sheriff? Well, not exactly, but after all, I've got the corpus delictuses. But nothing else? No, but I've got the place guarded. Not a soul can get past my men going or coming. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> I was taking my usual walk in the garden. I thought I'd drop in and see if there's anything that I could do. Did any of my men stop you on the way in? Why, no. I saw no one. Your deputy's a regular watchdog, Sheriff. They'll be bloodhounds when I get through dressing them down. Well, I think I'll get a little shut-eye, as you say in your column. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. I accompany you to the stairs. All right. Ah, oh, yeah. Cassie. Is there anything you want to tell me? No. Remember, I'll always stand by you. Don't overdo it. Good night. Good night. That sweet little soul who just left gives me the jiving jitters. I wonder who she'll kill next. Here, you cut that out. You're as jumpy as a pogo stick. She's not a killer. How do you know she isn't? Because she's not strong enough to shuffle the bodies of two full-grown men around like a set of Indian clubs. I guess you're right. How about a breath of fresh air before we turn in? I need it. How about you, Ed? No, thanks. Night air irritates my throat, unless it's in nightclubs. I'll grab a couple of shots of the Chamber of Horrors while you're gone. That room fascinates me.
Anything like me, I'll buy a dozen. Well, that is if the price is right. Look, Miss Cassie, are you nuts? The losses, I'm not. Then why are you wandering around in this subway? Looking for a new victim, I bet you. You think I'm a murderess? If you ain't, why are you here? Can you keep a secret? I'm a newspaper man. Answer my question. Sure, I can keep a secret. Follow me. <laughs> I don't suppose you've seen many $10,000 banknotes in your day, have you? $10,000 banknotes? Look, Miss Cassie, I'm lucky to cast my peepers on a double sawbuck, meaning 20 potatoes, meaning dollars to you. Well, here are 200 of them. Two million in currency and a million in securities. I want you to hold all of them for me for safekeeping. Me? Carry $3 million around with me? Lady, now I know you're crazy. No, I'm wise. Whoever is committing the murders is after my money. And it's someone who suspects I keep it in the library. Otherwise, why would Garson and Larry have been murdered in the library? Sounds reasonable. It is reasonable. But if you keep the money and the securities hidden safely in your camera case, no one will suspect. And I won't tell a soul. Because you might be murdered too. But you, know, you, you find yourself another boy. It ain't worth the risk. Oh, yes, it is. Because when the murder is apprehended, I'm going to give you one of these nice, crisp banknotes. You mean, you, you, you mean I get $10,000? Yes. Aunt Cassie, you made a deal. But you got any idea who the killer might be? Oh, I hope it isn't the one I suspect. Who's that? My neighbor, Trowbridge Montrose. You mean the flower smeller? Yes. He's been in love with me for years. I get it. A short engagement, huh? <laughs> No, we're not engaged. I can't make up my mind. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get around to it. What makes you think he's the killer? Because he was furious when my relatives tried to put me in the insane asylum. He cracked his knuckles. And every time he does that, I know he's furious. He wanted to give them a dose of his rose spray. You mean, you mean the poison that he kills the bugs with? Yes. Oh, I do hope the next murder is by poison. My mind will be relieved. Next murder? Oh, yes. There'll be other murders. <laughs> uh, goodbye. <laughs> oh, boy, this thing's got me stymied. Let's sit down. Okay. Ah, it's a cinch. It's not Aunt Cassie. She couldn't lug bodies around. Neither could Martha Denham. Nor Garson Denham's widow. Or that niece they, that lives with the old lady? Then it must be a man. How about Tom? Oh, Tom. He doesn't strike me as a boy kill his father and cousin. Somebody's coming. Hmm? 
Good evening. Oh, hello. Good evening. Not very sociable, are they? Well, what did you expect them to do, sit in your lap? Oh, stop snapping at me, O'Brien. Sorry. You were eliminating suspects. Well, the butler's out. He's an old family retainer. So's Katie the cook. Fat people seldom commit murder. But cooks do use knives. Oh, not knives. Antique knives, 200 years old. Well, there's still a chauffeur and the gardener. And Mr. Trowbridge Montrose. Oh, Montrose. Monty wouldn't hurt a fly. I don't know about that. When he talked about spraying bugs, he had an unholy look in his eyes. Now, let's take the gardener. You take him. All he wants is to be left alone. Well, there's still the chauffeur. He's out, too. He was asleep over the garage when Garson Denham was killed and under a car when Larry got it. Well, then who is the murderer? I don't know. Maybe it's the little man that turns out the lights and electric ice boxes. <laughs> Very funny. All on account of Aunt Cassie's money. If only she'd distribute it where it would do some good, there wouldn't have been any murders. Why, Tommy, you sound like you begrudge Aunt Cassie her money. I do. He's dead. Who did it? I don't know. We were sitting here talking when all of a sudden he groaned and then I heard someone run away. Come on, boys. Let's have a look around. We'd better go in the house. Hey, somebody over by that big tree. Nobody here. He didn't climb up. Yeah, but we saw him go behind the tree. Maybe he kept right on going with the tree between him and us. Uh, maybe you're right. Well, I guess that's that. I'll see you later. Come on, let's go. You. Well, who'd you think it was? Hey, suppose you tell me what you're doing sneaking around this time of night. I'm not sneaking around this time of night. I'm taking that can of oil to Michael in the garage. Oh, yeah? Well, come on. Let's see what Michael knows about this. Come on. Anybody here? Yeah. You want something? You send this fellow for a can of oil? Sure I did. What about it? Well, for your information, there's been another murder. Someone just killed Tommy Denham. Young Tommy? That's why I tackled you in the garden. Nah, uh, wouldn't you know it. Well, I guess we might as well start for the house. The sheriff will want to question everybody again. You know, if these murders don't stop, I'm never going to get that car greased. Oh, that's going to be tough. It's the same thing all over again. Everybody was everywhere else except where the murder was committed. Somebody's lying. Somebody in this room murdered three men. How long are you going to go on being a fool? You know she's the guilty one. I almost wish you were right. I confess and get it over with. It's all because of my money. If I thought I could expose the murderer, I'd destroy Greylock and all my wealth this minute. Cassie, what are you saying? I mean it. Sheriff, I wonder if I could have a word with Miss Cassie alone. Sure, go on. Thanks, Sheriff. Miss Cassie, would you mind stepping into the library for just a moment? Not at all. <sighs> Miss Cassie, you missed your calling. What are you talking about? You could have been the great American Bernhardt. Oh, that was a great act you put on out there. Come on, give. What's your angle? You're a young smart aleck, aren't you? Don't stall me. You've got something on your mind. What is it? Well, to tell you the truth, I've been toying with a surefire plan to trap the murderer. How? 
I've been living in this museum piece for 65 years. I'm sort of tired of it. It's sliding panels and hidden passages. Give me the horrors. Sliding panels, hidden passages? The place is honeycombed with them. The old shack was a headquarters for the colonial spies during the Revolutionary War and a station for an underground railroad during the Civil War. I tell you, Mr. White, every time you touch a wall in this place, it's liable to jump at you. Uh, underground. <laughs> yeah. Then maybe the murderer is hiding in one of those secret passages now. He might be. But if he isn't, my plan is still good. I'm going to set fire to Greylock. You're going to do what? I'm going to bring the old shack down. You see, whoever the killer is, he or she is after my money. Until today, I had three million in cash and securities hidden in this house. Today, I removed it. Your photographer has it hidden in his camera case. <laughs> you, you mean to say Eddie's got three million dollars carrying around with him in the camera case? Yes. <laughs> but if your money is safe, Miss Cassie, why burn the place down? Because the murderer will give himself away if he thinks the money is going up in smoke. The house means nothing to me. For 65 years, it's had me hanging on the ropes. I learned that bit of slang reading your column. <laughs> but listen, that's arson. Arson? No, it isn't. I've no insurance. I'm not cheating anybody. I'm just lighting a bonfire to take a great load off my shoulders. Oh, but it seems such a shame to destroy such a lovely old place. Oh, patient Tosh, if I don't burn it down, we'll all find ourselves in the cemetery. Besides, the upkeep of the old shack is terrific. What do you say? Will you help me? Well, okay, what's the setup? You get everybody outside on some pretext. Leave the rest to me. Keep your eyes open. And the first one who makes a break for the house is the murderer. So long, Mr. White. Hey, what do you mean, so long? Keep your eyes open. I certainly... Be so long, Mr. White. here at this hour of the night. Where's Aunt Cassie? Calm yourself and don't ask questions. Hey, look! Did I set it on fire? Told her she was crazy. What are you doing, Cassie? Don't you worry about any idea. be destroyed. I'm glad of it. <laughs> Money is a curse. A curse that breeds evil. Keep your eyes open for the break. You can't destroy it. It's mine. Mine, I tell you. I lived with you, put up with your strictness, pretended to love you, knowing that one day it would be mine. Oh, I hated you. That I pretended to love you, knowing that someday you would die and your money would be mine. And then when the other stepped in, I killed. Yes, Michael and I murdered so that one day it would all be mine. I would be your only heir. Turn her out. Don't shoot. My husband. Your husband? What are you talking about? We've been married over a year. Oh, don't let them kill him. Don't, please don't. I 
take you to the village. Come on. <laughs> I swear he dashed behind this tree. I saw him too. So did I. Come on. How come you're not playing Daniel Boone with the sheriff and his boys? It's not quite time for the Marines to move in. Are the Marines coming? They're practically here. Folks, follow me. I'm about to catch a killer. Come on, folks. Help me get this car off the grease pit. Stand back, folks. Tomorrow we'll have to do a little shooting. What is this? Quiet. Jerry comes down. Hey! Come on. Get out of there and keep your hands in the air. Hey! Where'd you find her? Popped out of a hole in the ground just like that. Thanks for tipping me off about those secret passages. I figured there must be one near that big tree in the garden after our friend here did that neat disappearing act early in the evening. Stay away, Sheriff. Hard. Courage, will you marry me? Cassie, do you mean it? Of course I do. I've got to live somewhere now that Greylock's no more. Maybe we can wake up Judge Hoskins and get hitched tonight. Darling. Love is in the air. Come on. Here's your money, Miss Cassie. And if it's all the same to you, I'll have my 10 G's at this moment. There you are. You've earned it. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh. Hey. Hey. Hey, this is Confederate money. It ain't worth a penny. I guess I'll forget to tell you all. I'm one of the Denims of Virginia, from the Deep South. <laughs> <laughs> Trowbridge, darling, you have enough real money for both of us, haven't you? Ample, my pet. You better have. You've been taking care of the old shack and all my relatives for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do we do now? I don't know what you're going to do, brother, but I'm going to do this. Okay. Hold it. The Hayes office ain't gonna like that long kiss. <laughs> 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 